Welcome to Pottywood. Hello everybody and welcome to the last in this series of Poddywood. Um, I am one of your co-hosts, Steve Hester, and with me as always is... Who the hell was that? That was uh, one of my stepdaughters, uh, Andrea, little four-year-old Andrea, and she wanted to, uh, to, to get involved. So I thought, okay, she can do that. Oh, well, that's a nice surprise for... Uh... The second of our... Well, I guess it's not even Christmas now, is it? No. it's Christmas is over. Well, I guess we can call this the New Year special now. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Roger Carson. I am the person who also does this show, as well as Steve, who obviously brings his family in to steal all the limelight these days. <laughs> once. Once. <laughs> that's, that's, that's fair enough. Nice to have you on the show, Andrea. Yes. Well, I'll stay off that tablet. <laughs> it's not her that's on the tablet. It's the other two killing my internet connection. Anyway, anyway, hello everyone. Um, I hope you all had uh, an amazing Christmas. I know it's been a bit rough with a lot of the COVID stuff that's been going around. And uh, I think we've all had reasons to have a really kind of crappy Christmas. But you know what? Here we are, still to give you an amazing episode. Uh, and Mark Marshall is going to be joining us later to celebrate a very special person. Mm-hmm. A very special person. Um, but before we get to that, we... We've got to do our shtick. Yes. Or should we say we've got to do our brick? But, but, oh. 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 I said brick. <laughs> so, as you people know, every week we do the What's in the Box segment, which has become an extremely popular uh, part because a lot of people actually do watch these movies. Mm. When we put them out, especially if they've not seen them, like yourself. Yes. And uh, last week, we pulled out Ryan Johnson's 2005 movie, Brick. Mm, Which I didn't realise was Ryan Johnson until I settled down to actually watch it. I know. Ryan Johnson, the director of fantastic movies like Knives Out, Looper, The Last Jedi. (laughs) (laughs) That is Uh, my trigger phrase. That really is. Oh, I had so much joy when I realised, oh my God, this is a Ryan Johnson. I'm not going to tell him because instantly he's going to hate it before it's even started. No, I tried to do due diligence. I tried to be professional. Um, I tried. Think, I tried. Um, I think the best thing that I'm going to say before we get into the review is that even though I didn't like this movie, I also didn't hate it. Okay. I think that's probably the best way to describe it. Um, and speaking of describing it, the plot is effectively what would happen if a Raymond Chandler, Maltese Falcon, Sam Spade kind of movie was to be made in an American high school. Now, yes. forget the, the mean streets of Los Angeles or Chicago. No, this is Orange County, well known for, you know... Gangsters Orange. and thugs and all the rest of it. Um, you have Jason Gordon-Levitt plays Brandon, whose girlfriend uh, rings him up out of the blue after disappearing off the face of the earth for about two months to request his help. And then two days afterwards, she winds up dead in a drainage tunnel and he goes out of his way to then try and get to the bottom of her murder, find out who killed her why and along the way he meets a sordid cast of various underworld shady people including the pin the kingpin played by um lucas has yep yes yes because i knew it was someone has and i couldn't remember what his first name was the the film plays very very close with the archetypes of the genre so you do have the the big bad guy you've got the muscle You've got the hard-boiled and grizzled detective. You've got the femme fatale. You've got the woman in distress. And um, and there's also the MacGuffin there, which is in the shape of the, the brick, which kind of set the whole thing off and set it into motion. 
and in the brick in this case is a brick of uh, of drugs it is kind of it's a weird one to approach because the the stakes kind of feel both very very large in a, on a personal level and also almost non-existent at the same time mainly because the whole feel of the the movie is one of it feels like it should be a comedy but it isn't yes there's there's no kind of little nods to the camera to a- acknowledge the absurdity of everything like there's a scene in there where the the kingpin uh is talking with Brandon after Brandon's just had the crap beaten out of him in uh, in his uh, little basement and the kingpin obviously he's like in high school as well and so he's getting his mum to serve them breakfast and he's sat there in like a a black long black cloak with a cane a walking stick with a duck's head on it and his mum's busy bustling around going oh i got oj and i've got apple juice and you want water i'm afraid we've only got this kind of water and the whole thing reeks of like a student comedy but you never get that kind of nod, and it it just feels out of place. It feels like they either need to kind of steer into the skin and make it more serious, or go the other way and have like that little nod and a wink to the audience to to go, ah, yeah, you know, we we know that this is an absurd kind of thing, uh, and it makes it feel doubly strange because at the start of this, you do have an actual murder, which kicks the whole story off. Which, yeah, it comes back into touch at the end of the story, but for most of it, it's it feels like just the catalyst. It doesn't feel like actually something which which is being worked towards. I don't know, it's, it's kind of weird the way that it shifts from one to the other. Well, this is, um, it is Ryan, isn't it? Ryan Johnson. It's just spelt Ryan. I think it is Ryan, yeah. Ryan, yeah. Um, but uh, it was his first project at film school. Mm. Um, you know, and then the, the movie was... Uh, it was financed by his parents, I believe. Uh, it was edited on a home computer. And it's something that uh, I'd love to kind of hear the story of how they got um, Gordon Levitt involved. Mm. Uh, but apparently he did absolutely fall in love and, and took real ownership of you know his involvement in that movie. Because I, I think it had many false starts at the beginning. Mm. Uh, and... You know, they had to kind of rearrange things according to their budget. And they just went and shot it. And I really like that. I really like that approach. And pretty much how a lot of my movies ended up getting made. Let's just go, go and shoot it. Um, I think that's how a lot of filmmakers got kind of their first movie off the ground. Is they went in kind of hard and dirty with a lot of guerrilla filmmaking wherever possible. Oh, yeah. And yeah, putting yeah. corners. And they're never going to. to look nice. Yeah, you, you've got to. You've got to even more nowadays if you're just starting out. I mean, I've had that many false starts over financing of projects in the last 10 years that I just go and shoot the shit now. You know, it's like, let the financing catch up with you. You know, mm. just, But at least you've got kind of a full ownership. I mean, for me, when I watched it again, it felt like, you know, Dashiell Hammett meets Cowboy Bebop. And there's very good references to both. Uh, in styles because Gordon Levitt is very Spike Siegel uh, in the look. Pretty much everything about him is very Spike Siegel. I do wish which, though that he'd take his damn hands out of his pockets. Yeah, that was that yeah, was that winding was me up. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. You know, and this was the 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 full start for Ryan Johnson, and he's he's gone on to amazing things and not so amazing things in your case. <laughs> but um, this movie does have one of the greatest foot chases I think I've ever seen in a movie. Yeah. Yeah, where one of the uh, one of the assassins comes after him, and I will say this: that there is some rather smart things, particularly in some of the fight sequences. There's lots of quite smart choreography that goes on in there, um, and there's also one very very nice shot where I think it's one of the characters called Tug um, punches him. But then there's this weird kind of camera move, and it, there's no other way to describe it other than a camera move. But it just feels so kinetic, and it's a wonderful little shot. It is. Uh, I, I've got to commend um, Ryan Johnson on this. I, I think the most passion you get as a filmmaker is that first film out mm. the door. All of your energy and all your love of you know what you built up has really put into your first movie, which is why... You know, there's so many independent directors who have trouble following up once they get in the kind of Hollywood system and the 
they just end up making well i guess the last jedi i guess but um that those first movies i really love of directors because it's their voice you mm-hmm. know and and it's they're firing on all cylinders and i believe ryan johnson was on this i'm a big fan of this movie um uh, because I, I i like film noir and i know you like film noir as yeah. well and, and yeah. it was it was a very good throwback and a lot of <laughs> directors always will put references to the films that inspire them in their first movie it is so always so apparent unless you're tarantino and then the references just carry on through your entire career you just claim that they're yours um but yeah i've got uh, a lot of respect for this movie uh, for ryan johnson's contributions on it yeah. and for his later stuff knives out looper uh, i've i'm not as easily offended by the last jedi as you are but, um... <laughs> yeah i think it's very easy to get sidetracked by personal opinion on one project versus the way you should be objective so i'm hoping that i have come across a bit more objective with this one because you have. i i i make no bones about the fact that i despise and detest the last jedi with all of my being but in terms of a first movie first out the gate i could i've definitely seen far worse without question I can say something that was really funny because when I put up on the actual Pottywood Facebook page uh, the fact that this was the what's in the box and that you had to watch it and I mentioned the fact that it's a Ryan Johnson who directed The Last Jedi and uh, your lovely partner Amanda went, oh this is going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> I like how she knew about this being Ryan oh, Johnson yes. before I did. And the fact that she obviously didn't tell you before you sat down to no, watch it. No. She, she's good at keeping those secrets. She, yeah. She's in for your suffering. So, yes, uh, Brick was what's in the box. Uh, and it's the last one for this season. Mm, yeah, it is. So, would you recommend Brick to people? I, 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 I think I would. I think the plot kind of gets a, almost in its own way a little bit towards the end. Um, but, you know, in, it is it is a decent enough watch. I think it's a little bit long, but it's a decent enough watch. Fair enough. And with that in mind, I guess it's for the last time this season to look at some anniversaries. We watch them again all of the time, or we get them on Prime for free. But we only know how old they are when we learn their anniversary. I'm so glad you queued up the right music for the last show. <laughs> Because uh, that would have been absolutely disastrous if that had happened. So, can you believe, Steve? Go on. 40 years ago this week, a movie by the name of Neighbours was released. And no, not the Australian soap. Oh. This was a comedy starring John Belushi. I have a vague, very vague memory of this. But it might just be a conflicting memory of the one... Was it Zac Efron and... Um... Yeah, there, there was that Rubin. as well, which was basically kind of the same premise, but a little bit different. Uh, but this one was directed by John G. Avildsen, who some people will know as the director of Rocky. He was also the director of The Karate Kid. But hold your applause, because he also directed Rocky Five and The Karate Kid Part Three. <sighs> Yay. Yeah. So the, the thing about this, I mean, it's a story where um, John Belushi... Uh, and Dan Aykroyd uh, take the the neighbors roles. Uh, Belushi actually takes the straight man approach, which was very weird. And Dan Aykroyd took the uh, the irritable, weird neighbor. And Belushi's life is obviously interrupted by Dan Aykroyd and his wife, played by Kathy Moriarty, when they move in next door. And yeah, it, it was very strange that I remember that Belushi was kind of taking the straight role uh, because this uh, this was actually his final movie. And it wasn't his final great movie because that was Continental Divide, uh, which is a bold statement for anyone who's seen Blues Brothers, Animal House and all of those. Uh, But this was, uh, it was a very troubled production because the stars uh, were clashing with the director. The director was clashing with the producers. I think every single person involved on that line wanted to do rewrites. Uh, John Belushi, uh, pretty much, well, he straight out accused the writer Larry Gelbert of excessive drinking, which is the biggest <laughs> case of pot kettle black you could probably yeah. get. Um, had Dan Aykroyd himself said in an interview that the production crew was basically on cocaine for the entire shoot, which 
the sad story is, is that John Belushi was actually clean at that point, but this is the movie which sucked him back in uh, to drug use, which led to his death like six months later. Uh, so Belushi was not happy with John Giovilson, the director. He wanted, uh, I think he actually contacted John Landis to take over. And I think John Landis was up to it until he realized that they were already under production and stuff had actually been shot and then he kind of turned it down. And the result is a movie that's not really funny. I remember the last time that I saw it, which wasn't so long ago, I think it was on Paramount TV or something along those lines. And it's not a funny movie. And in comparison, uh, the Zac Efron and uh, is it Seth Rogen? I think it's Seth, Seth Rogen, Rogen version. It's hilarious. Uh, and that's the kind of version of Neighbours that you should really see. And I think the only reason you'd want to see this movie is, is if you've got a, a fondness for Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi. But yeah, it's uh, it's not a fondly remembered movie. And it's just a shame that it is the last piece of work on John Belushi's resume. Well, you could also put the uh, the the curse of Nanook of the North down that one. But um... But anyway, can you believe, Steve... Yes, I can. 20 years ago this week, (laughs) The Fellowship of the Ring was released. Oh, yay! Oh, you've been waiting for this to come up, haven't you? Oh, I I got way too overly excited. Um, uh, Yeah, I think we we mentioned ages ago when we were doing... We did did a Nominate 5 and it was for you. Yes. Where I asked you to nominate the movies that you've you've pretty much bought on every single format. Yes. This is one of mine. I've uh, I think the only thing that I've not bought it on was VHS, but I had it on DVD. I had the extended cut. Then I had it on Blu-ray. Now I've literally just the other week bought the 4K versions from iTunes. Wow. So yeah. Yeah. I love these movies. That- it's hard to believe it's 20 years because I remember going to see this and we went to a midnight screening of it, uh, of me and a friend of mine, funny enough, whose name was Matt Jackson, because this movie is directed by Peter Jackson, who directed, as you all know, all of the trilogy mm-hmm. and as well as movies like Bad Taste, Brain which Dead. was his first movie, Brain Dead, which is absolutely incredible, but incredibly gross. Oh, yeah, it's uh, disgusting. It really is. Yes. The Frighteners, which is also one of my favourite movies. And uh, I think of everything, Stanley Kubrick would be so proud of Lord of the Rings because it was like 274 day shooting across 16 months. Mm. <laughs> I think maybe maybe that took his title on uh, Eyes Wide Shut. Who knows? I think he'd be pissed off that they were able to get three movies made in that space of time. Oh, yeah. But come on. What an amazing three movies. Oh, yeah. No and I'm, I'm going to go on record here. The, I think if you classed the original Lord of the Rings trilogy as one, it is the best fantasy movie of all time. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, 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 you can fight me on it, right? But I know a lot of people say, "Oh, Star Wars," well, you know, whatever. But uh, Lord of the Rings is the best fantasy movie of all time in my book because it, it ticks all boxes. You know, I mean, look at the case of you know the the cast that they had is perfect for it and still celebrated to this day i mean orlando bloom was still in drama school when he landed that role yeah he was yeah he was um then you had dominic monaghan who who'd been in the hetty waynthrop mysteries on the bbc i think that was like his big deal and next thing you know he's a hobbit yeah um i'm trying to think because i'd seen obviously sean astin in a few things mm-hmm. over the years well the goonies well, well you hadn't seen the goonies well, i'd seen point. bits of the goonies um, but Elijah Wood, later. I think I think Elijah Wood hadn't uh, hadn't really been on much of the radars for me. Oh no, no, he, he'd been in quite a lot of stuff uh, leading up to that. Seed of Chucky hadn't been in much from what I do. No, <laughs> that's Billy Boyd for anyone who doesn't know. But yeah, it's like the, one of those movies that has as many listings for award wins as it does listings for injuries during the course of that <laughs> entire movie. Oh, yeah. So I love the Vigo half face, Vigo Mortensen's half face, because apparently he went surfing in New Zealand and uh, he damaged half of his face. So there's a good portion of the movie where you're only seeing one side of his face. <laughs> the thing is, he's one of those movies which the people that love the movie 
get really into the production side of it. And I've lost count of the number oh, yeah. of times I've seen the appendices uh, on the on the DVDs and what have you. And you know, you've, you're talking about injuries. You've got stuff like Sean Aston when he walks into the river at the end and uh, steps on like a broken bottle or something, and it cuts mm. right through his Hobbit foot. So oh, yeah. he, he was saying that he had to then get airlifted out of the hospital because they were in really remote location with it all. And then when they got to hospital, the doctor was there going, oh my God, what have you done to your foot? It's falling apart. And then he finally realized that he was a prosthetic and he had to open the prosthetic <laughs> to then get to his actual foot underneath. Oh yeah, and that, that, that's just like the, the chip of the iceberg. Well, the saying of chipping out, Viggo Mortensen chipped his tooth, yep. but he also broke his foot by kicking a helmet. Yep, <laughs> you have, uh, tells, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Liv Tyler stabbed herself in the thigh. John Rhys Davis caught inflammation around the eyes from the prosthetics. Orlando Bloom broke a rib. Jesus Christ, this is like... I'd wager this might be the most casualties during a movie (laughs) of a main cast of all time. I'd love to see if it wins that award. Um, And I I watched it again. I watched the extended editions. I don't watch the theatrical versions now that the extended versions are out because you just want to lose yourself in this, in these movies. It is amazing. I I cannot wait to one day be able to go to New Zealand, but uh, I love the fact where they used very practical effects for some things. And no more is that more impressive than the forced perspective on the cart scene at the beginning. Yeah. Where Elijah, you, you're thinking, it's like, oh, they've you know, digitally shrunk him. No, Elijah's actually sat three feet behind Ian McKellen as Gandalf on this cart. And you cannot tell. No. It is amazing. And, and it, I'm like, it gets even better when you get to a little tiny things like in Hobbiton. And um, I can't. Remember. I think it's Frodo, and he gives um, and he gives a, a, a cup of tea to Gandalf, and he's pouring the kettle out. But there's a camera move as well, and the table was split into two, and one part of the table was moving differently to the other part, and it was all timed so that the camera move lined up perfectly. And it's it's I, I challenge anyone to work out where things are actually moving. It's it's. The level of detail that went into that was astounding. It really yeah. was. I mean, uh, let's let's tick the boxes here. The most amazing things about Fellowship of the Rings. Everyone knows the score to mm-hmm. this day. You know that that score. Everyone can hum it. Uh, the digital and visual effects are still amazing to this day. Mm-hmm. Production design, incredible. Cinematography is beautiful. Uh, the makeup is probably the most impressive we've ever seen. Uh, the sound is great. The sound and editing are, are just absolutely otherworldly. And in the cast, you've got these standout performances from Ian McKell and uh, Orlando Bloom. I'll, I'll give him that. Uh, Elijah Wood's great. Kate Blanchett is to die for. Amazing. All across the board. Um, mm-hmm. Fellowship of the Ring extended version, I will say. But um, 20 years old this week. Uh and what what an impressive one to kind of put in our anniversaries. It yeah. just had to be brought up. The movie that kicked Harry Potter's ass from number one, I would yeah. say. I could talk about this. Just I could have an entire special just talking about these movies. I really could. You could. But you can't because the last of our anniversaries, can you believe, Steve, mm-hmm. 15 years ago this week, Night at the Museum was released. I haven't actually seen it. Probably not missing much. Um, And that's not being nasty. I went to see this at the cinemas and kind of left with a... It didn't really do anything for me. And then I realised, well, it's really aimed at kids, you know, because we've been seeing... Yeah, You used to look at a movie with Ben Stiller and Owen Wilson and that in it, and you're thinking, oh, Zoolander, you know, I'm actually going to laugh at this. And it, it was more aimed at kids. Which is fair enough. I mean, this was directed by Sean Levy, who I think most people will remember as, more as a producer these days. He was the producer of Arrival, uh, Dennis Villeneuve's movie. He's also the producer of Stranger Things on Netflix. Amazing right. show. I keep I keep getting him mixed up with um, I can't with remember Eugene Levy's son. Yeah, yeah. Because isn't, isn't, isn't I did he the Sean same Levy thing. as well? That could be actually, just spelt differently. Yeah. I bet they get it all the time. 
but yes, uh, it, and he was also a producer of stuff like uh, The Spectacular Now. Uh, unfortunately, he was also the producer of that movie, The Internship, with Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson going to work at Google. And I, I didn't really like that movie at all. <laughs> so the wedding crashes go viral. Wow. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Wow. wow. Uh, but the things that Night at the Museum gave us, uh, the debut of Rami Malek, mm-hmm. who played uh, the Egyptian prince slash king whichever it was. Uh, this was also one of the first big theatrical appearances for Ricky Gervais, doing his usual thing of not finishing his sentences. Yeah. I mean, it is a very Gervaisism, and he does it in this to a, a kind of annoying degree. Uh, you know, Ricky Gervais, is, is, you know, he's got his fans, he's got his knockers, but um, it, it is what he is. And in movies like Ghost Town, which came a couple of years afterwards, that's really good. Mm. But in this, it was kind of like, you're just there. You know, and, and whether that was a way of, oh, we're going to introduce you to the international audiences or whatever and just give you this kind of small role. I think maybe it was a, a payback for Ben Stiller doing extras, possibly. Right. But, you know, it's one of those things. But um, the two things I always find really interesting about this, uh, one which I think it was designed for and one which it probably didn't expect, the first one being uh, the actual American Museum of Natural History did have a 20% increase in visitors when this movie opened. That I can very easily believe. Which is understandable. I think this movie yeah. was kind of really intended as a, you know, kit for kids to go and check out museums and, and get more involved in history because it is one of those things that brings characters in to really educate, you know, and a lot of the characters do give a little bit of sidebars about their history and things like that. So... In that, I get. But unfortunately, and the one thing I do remember incredibly uh, well, coming from the video store background, is that a lot of the cinema chains here in the UK actually pulled the movie from screenings uh, due to a deal that 20th Century Fox made. Uh, They made the call to release it uh, on home video three months after its theatrical debut. And as you may know, uh, back then it was around a five to six month window. Yeah. So it's not the first time that has happened because it also happened with Alice in Wonderland as well with Disney. And considering the state of the world now, the fact that they're releasing them on the same bloody day, and now we can pray for a three month theatrical window. <laughs> I uh, know you look at something like The Matrix and first day of release is in cinemas and it's on HBO Max. So yeah. it's I, it's good in a way because there are some people that just don't want to go to the cinema personally. Um, I, I, I'm looking forward to chains being open more. Yeah. Damn it. I came from a time when you had to wait six months to watch a movie if you didn't have a cinema in your town. And in my hometown, we didn't have a cinema. Most of the stuff I saw was from video stores, and that's something that actually exists, boys and girls. Six months? You were lucky to have six months. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. You you had to wait an entire year after release on video for it to come on TV. Yeah. (sighs) It was a year for Sky TV and two years for terrestrial TV. Oh, God. Imagine that. I know. <laughs> Jeez. Imagine how pissed they would have been that all the movies from the pandemic had pushed back. Oh, God. It would probably just be four years to see it on normal TV. I know. Who'd give a shit about Top Gun Maverick after four years? <laughs> everyone's, everyone's watching it going, ooh, Tom Cruise looks young, doesn't he? Realising <laughs> that he was filmed the ages ago. Yeah. <laughs> Most people have probably forgot Top Gun is even a thing now. I know. Oh, but yes, um, Night at the Museum, uh, 15 years ago. It's it's a film. You know, it's, it's one of those films. And the sequels as well. Uh, they're just there. Yeah, it's something that will keep your kids entertained. And, you know, if, if they ask to go to a museum, then it's doing its job, really. I think that's the best that you can uh, that you can hope for in these situations, that you end up with a uh, an institution which does educate and entertain, gets a little bit more of a, a boost from ticket sales. Yes. I'm all behind Exactly. That. And speaking of an institution, uh, this week is the long-awaited uh, Richard Donner tribute episode, uh, which a lot of people have been very receptive to and, and really been looking forward to it. 
and uh, I don't think we can withhold it any longer. Well, here we are. It is the end of the year. It is the end of Pottywood season two. And when I think of this time of year, just after Christmas leading up to New Year, I think of all of those movies that we would usually get on TV, which has somewhat kind of lost its appeal now that everything is streaming through platforms. And back in the day, the most exciting part of picking up the TV or Radio Times, the Christmas edition, was always seeing what movies were on over the holiday period. Uh, back when we only had four channels, BBC mm. One, Two, and Granada, and Channel Four. Shout outs to the channels. Uh, now, almost everyone will remember that on these occasions over the Christmas period, we would see movies like Superman the Movie, The Goonies, Scrooge, Lethal Weapon, The Toy. These were always Christmas viewing. They were also directed by one man. Richard Donner, who we sadly lost in July of 2021. Now, for the following few days, every single person in the industry had fond memories of this director that they were sharing out on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, everywhere. That legions of cinema goers were also paying tribute to the man. So it only felt right that today, for our last episode, we wanted to hear all about the man from a man who was the closest to him. And that was Mark Marshall. Now, when Mark Marshall first appeared on our show this year, it was less than 24 hours after Richard had passed. And we made the decision not to cover Mark's time at the Donner Company and the time spent on all of the projects with him. We felt it was too raw at the time. Uh, so we decided that it would be fitting to see out 2021 and season two of Pottywood, honoring the man at the time where everyone enjoyed him the most. So joining us today from Enid, Oklahoma, is Mark Marshall. Good morning, Mark. Hey, guys. we got to stop meeting like this. I know. People are going to talk, <laughs> aren't they? <laughs> I hope so. How's the weather over there, Mark? It's, it's miserably good, and I hate it. <laughs> you lucky swine. Don't, don't get me started. This is not how December is supposed to be in Oklahoma. Well, if it makes you feel any better, it's absolutely miserable and uh, coronavirus rampant here in the UK right now. At least you've kind of got that, those open plains where the wind is whistling down. We do, and we, and we also have the world's tallest Christmas tree. Oh, how big is that? Yeah. It's 140 feet tall, twice the size of uh, the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree. And uh, this is the first year we've had it, um, courtesy of a, of a local entrepreneur. And, um, and uh, it, yeah, it's the world's tallest Christmas tree. Now... A few weeks ago, we had a huge wind, which we usually do, and the top 27 feet broke off, but they put it back on, I think Gorilla Glue, and it's, it's, uh, it's splendorous. I mean, it's, it's got lights and decorations all over it. Uh, we've got a skating rink, and so, um, you know, it's, uh, it definitely is Christmas time. Well, being it's Christmas time, obviously, we've always said that we wanted to bring you back uh, to talk about Dick Donner. Uh, obviously, that you have known him for the better part of what thirty years, thirty-seven, actually thirty-seven. How many? Years. Thirty-seven years. Thirty-seven years. Okay, and obviously within that, there is a ton of projects. Obviously, that you've worked on together. We're kind of starting out. Uh, let's kind of go back to your first meeting with Richard. How did this come about? Uh, Dick accepted the directing role uh, in Goonies. Uh, Stephen had reached out to him, needed someone who could wrangle kids and and bring some some truthfulness to uh, this amazing you know story of a, this adventure story, and uh, so Dick read it and loved it and accepted. And I met Dick during one of the casting sessions for Goonies uh, at Amblin. Uh, Dick came over and I was running camera, and uh, it was Stephen and, and Dick and then Mike Fenton the casting director in there. And uh, um, when Stephen introduced me to Dick, the first thing I said to, to him was, um, you're the man responsible for my nightmares. And he looked surprised. And then I explained to him that when I was eight years old, I saw his Twilight Zone episode, Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. <laughs> and when William Shatner th throws open that curtain and that gremlin is staring right at him at the window, I freaked out, and to this day I can't sleep 
with, with you know with open windows or open curtains. I have to have you know it has to be dark. So when I told Dick that, he actually thought that was one of the best compliments he'd ever received. And uh, so I think that kind of broke the ice. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, over the next few weeks, we did the casting sessions. And when it came time to start shooting the film, they, they went to Astoria first. And I had uh, I had been at Amblin for almost uh, 10 months at that point, And I had a, a week's vacation coming to me. And I had really never been on a set where I felt like I belonged. So I asked Stephen if I could take my week's vacation and go to Astoria. And Stephen said, it's fine with me, but make sure you get Dick's blessing first. So I called uh, the production office and talked to Jenny Liu, who was Dick's assistant at the time, and, and, and told her I wanted to come up. And she said, well, let me talk to Dick. And, and uh, I guess about a day later, I received a call from Michael Thaw, who was Dick's personal assistant at the time. And, you know, he said, Dick wanted to know if you are still coming up. And I kind of detected in his voice there might be some problem. So I said, uh, is there a problem? And he said, well, yeah, there's a problem. Dick said, if you're crazy enough to come up here, he's paying for the airplane flight. And, uh, and so that was, I guess, confirmation that, that Dick accepted me and I was okay. He wasn't going to plan on sticking a little gremlin on the wing of the plane, was he? No, no there was no gremlin <laughs> on the wing of the plane, but there was, but there was a monster named John Matuzak. Um, on the same flight, who uh, Randy Widener's uh, John stunt double, sloth stunt double, um, remembered as being very rude to me, and he had a talk with John, and John apologized. I don't remember that at all, but but so so it wasn't exactly a gremlin. <laughs> Well, you might actually be interested to know that after our previous conversation, when I uh, I dropped the bomb, the bombshell that I had never seen Goonies all the way through, I did actually sit down this afternoon and watch it. And 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 uh, it's very hard to concentrate on a movie when you've got a four year old trying to stick stuff into your ear. <laughs> I thought that would add to the experience. <laughs> no, he's trying to. I'm, I'm there. I'm trying to listen to what they're talking about with all the puzzles in the cave and everything. And and the they they ended up getting a key and the, the little skeleton face key, and they've got to put it on the the lock and twist it round. And um, and I've I've got my uh, my one of my stepdaughters, and uh, she's desperately trying to just get my attention with something. And then I look up, and this key suddenly appeared. I'm going. What's go? Where, where's that come from? Thinking I was having like another COVID kind of blank out, and my <laughs> and my girlfriend said, "No, you just missed it. It's fine. I'll fill you in on what's happened later on." <laughs> no, I enjoyed it. I've got a raft of questions about this movie, but we're probably going to be getting onto a lot of them in uh, in a short while. But yes, I did actually get to watch it. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm really glad to hear that. Well, Mark, uh, when you came onto the Goonies, obviously you were working for Amblin, so you were working for Steven Spielberg at the time. Uh, was it kind of two different teams of it being uh, Richard Donner and Spielberg? And, and how did you kind of find yourself within that coalition? So I, I mentioned that I that Dick paid my way up to uh, the set, and I was just going to spend a week just watching and learning. And because I, eventually I wanted to get into production. And uh, the second day, they put me to work. So I, I assisted Frank Marshall when he directed Second Unit. And um, one of the days, Dick was directing the uh, title, opening title sequence where the kids are doing things on the police cars and you know, chasing the Fratellis. And um, Data was uh, doing his, his suction dart or whatever and, and being pulled into the trash can. And they were actually they actually shot that in Astoria, and it was late in the day. It was the last thing that was being shot, and they didn't have one of the stunt guys. So Dick said, "Get in the car, kid." And uh, so I had to drive in with these these stunt drivers uh, in a you know in a line of cars, throwing mud and rocks up in the windshield, and I couldn't turn the windshield wipers on. And after all that and being terrified, um, they ended up. It, it was too dark, so they, they cut that. Um, but again, that was just, I, I started feeling like I was really a part of the group. So I ended up staying up there the entire three weeks. Stephen came up to do some second unit. And I want to clear the air about something because I think, you know, people seem to be under the impression that 
that Stephen kind of wormed his way in and and started directing second unit. That's not true at all. Dick asked Stephen to do second unit because there was just so much with the, you know the kids were in every scene just about and and they can only work a certain number of hours during the day. So they really and they had so many scenes. So Dick asked Stephen if he would direct second unit and. I mean, Stephen did the opening jailbreak scene uh, in the movie, and uh, but that was really about it for uh, Astoria. And then when we got back, uh, Stephen took the wishing well in the organ chamber, uh, some of the pickup shots there, things like that. But um, no, they it was, listen. It was a perfectly harmonious group. Uh, I, I was truly amazed. Stephen had a tremendous amount of respect for Donner, and I think it was vice versa. So there were. No egos involved. And, and Dick was one of those guys who, you know, he, he, as far as he was concerned, he got paid. So if Stephen wanted to direct something, you know, and, and change something, fine. He was, he was fine with it. Um, it didn't threaten his ego at all. So it was, it was really a great, uh, a great t- couple of sets to work on. Uh, watching it tonight, the one thing which does seem to strike me more than anything else is that probably more so than a lot of his his other movies, the flow of minute to minute dialogue and action seems to be very very loose, almost improvisational at times. Was this a deliberate choice? Yes, definitely. Um, Dick's motto uh, over all of his films that he did was verisimilitude or truth. As in Superman the movie, you know, Dick told the the cast, uh, especially Christopher Reeve, you know, you can fly. And, um, you know, Superman does exist and, and it helped them get into that mindset. And with the kids, Dick's selling point was he wanted them to be kids. He wanted them to be real. So he wanted them talking over each other. Um, he wanted them improvising. And fortunately we had a group of kids who were excellent at that. And they, and as a result, they come across as very real, uh, and, uh, you know, and very ordinary. Um, so, that was definitely a, a conscious choice on Dick's part. Okay, well, I know that you've uh, recently had a little bit of a Goonies reunion online uh, this past week, of which I've seen, which was apparently a huge surprise. It was. How did that go? You seem to have a good majority of the people involved in the Goonies online. The group was at uh, the uh, Steel City Comic Con in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, over the weekend. And Corey had sent me a text. I hadn't actually talked to Corey for a while. And suddenly I get this text saying, do you have Zoom? And uh, so I, he, he sent me an invitation and I got on thinking I was just going to talk to him. And it was, uh, it was Corey and his wife and Key and his wife, um, Carrie Green, Joe Pantoliano and Robert Davi. Uh, Sean had already, had already left. He was there, but he had already left for the day. So it was, uh, they were at dinner and it was really noisy, but it was just a joy. I hadn't seen Carrie in 36 years. Wow. Yeah. So it was just a, such a fun time. We reminisced a little bit, uh, you know, with Joey and Robert talking about the practical joke that was played on Donner in Hawaii. And, and uh, um, yeah, we just kind of picked up where we left off. I'm aware of the, the joke, but do you want to uh, expand on that for the people that don't know? The last couple of weeks of production, it was, it was just nonstop. Uh, the kids were being traded between stage 16, where the pirate ship was, and stage 15, where the wishing well, organ chamber, and water slide was. And uh, the kids were being bandy back and forth. Well, one of the mornings, uh, Jeff Cohen came in, who, the kid who played Chunk, and had a suitcase that said Maui or bust. And now Dick had a beach house in Maui, and he was counting the days until he could get there. Um, I mean, he loved those kids, but, you know, as he said in this, in the uh, making of, he said, individually, they're the warmest, uh, funniest things that have come into my life. But in a composite form, uh, I contemplate suicide every day. Um, <laughs> Dick was just, I, and, and they were, they were, they were always all over Dick and, and uh, shouting and, you know, trying to get his attention. And he was an avowed bachelor at the time. He hadn't, he hadn't met Lauren Schuler Donner yet, or he hadn't met her, but hadn't, uh, they hadn't married. And, um, so Jeff had his suitcase and Dick laughed and said, no way kid. And, uh, he said, go show Spielberg. So Jeff trotted over to stage 15 and, and, uh, showed Steven and Steven said, I have an idea. Um, 
so he called me over and he said, I want you to, to arrange for all the kids and a parent or guardian and the, and the Fratellis to go to Hawaii, go to Maui and, uh, and surprise Dick. So uh, very uh, cagely said, uh, well, uh, who's going to chaperone this? And Stephen said, okay, you go. So I, the provision was I had to take the, the beta movie camera that we had and, and record it. St- uh, Stephen's one condition was, he said, if Donner finds out about this, the trip is off. So you can't say a thing. And that was the hardest thing for them to keep a secret um, among those among, among that group. So uh, uh, the last two weeks, the kids were so afraid they were going to, you know, blurt it out to Dick that they ignored him. You know, they took direction during the scenes and stuff, but they stayed away from him. And Dick was genuinely hurt. He thought, you know, I, I thought I had a good rapport with the kids, but I guess I don't know children at all. And so the night of the uh, the last shot was the rap party, and Dick was already on a plane uh, to Maui. We had a couple of extra days of, of shooting second unit with Stephen. So I think it was the 20th of February, we got on the plane and all went over. Corey had missed the flight, so we had to bring him over later. Uh, but we got there, and Stephen's housekeeper, or Dick's housekeeper, got him out of uh, the house for the day. So we arrived on a bus and we brought our suitcases in. We trashed the place and uh, opened the you know the refrigerator door and took out food. And Dick finally came back uh, from his being out for the afternoon, and he was a little buzzed. Um, you know what I mean. <laughs> and uh, he came around the corner to the back of the house, and there were a couple of kids sitting on the back patio, and very nonchalantly said, Oh, hi, Dick. And, <laughs> and, and, and Jeff Cohen was in uh, uh, the house watching TV and said, Dick, I'm trying to watch this effing movie. And Dick literally went into shock and he sat down in one of the chairs and started rocking back and forth going, Oh my God. Oh my God. And the kids all descended on him and started hugging him. And he just, he, he just couldn't comprehend what was going on. Finally, uh, he got his wits about him, and the kids were all yelling at the same time. And so Dick went, "Shut up!" and uh, <laughs> and that's when Dick went out to the yard toward the uh, toward the shore, and the Fratellis come up from the uh, shore, and they're all over each other, you know, and pretending to fight. And Dick lost it; he lost <laughs> his legs went out from under him, and he fell to the grass, and he couldn't stop laughing. And it was one of the most memorable things that ever happened to him. He, he was he was so touched, but he also told me to, to tell Stephen that uh, they were bringing Donner home on an air ambulance. So uh, you know, <laughs> Dick has such a quick wit. Uh, so anyway, we that night we uh, did a barbecue, and uh, Dick invited his next door neighbor Alice Cooper over, and the kids got to meet Alice Cooper and stuff. And then that later that night we actually got on a plane to Honolulu and Stephen treated everyone to uh, four days in Honolulu. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> but we have it on tape. You know, I've, I've seen this footage and it is just so great to see as well. And uh, as you mentioned, Jeff Cohen, I mean, I don't think anyone came out of this movie with more notoriety than Chunk. Yes. <laughs> that, what, one of the greatest stories that I always hear is when um, Chunk is doing the full confession, and then he's uh, there eating the ice cream, and uh, they actually snatch the ice cream off him, and then snatch the spoon, and he starts crying. And apparently, Richard Donner ruined a couple of takes by laughing. Apparently, in one version of the movie, you can actually still hear him laughing. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. And, it, and you know what? It wasn't just Donner. There, there was a scene that was cut in the freezer uh, with the dead FBI agent who happened to be Teddy Grossman, who was in all of Steven's movies. Um, in fact, Teddy was the guy in the rowboat in Jaws who gets his leg bitten off. And <laughs> Oh, my so, God, it is. <laughs> yeah. So so Teddy's playing the, the dead FBI agent, and they're doing the scene, and Teddy keeps falling over onto Jeff, and Jeff is going, stay. And so Dick says, tell him a joke. So Jeff is you know so manic, and he says, uh, what's green and flies over Germany? 
it's Nazis. And, <laughs> and, and Teddy Grossman starts works. laughing. Yeah, yeah, Teddy Grossman starts <laughs> laughing, just like you are, Steve. And uh, it, finally, after three or four takes with a different joke each time, Teddy Grossman said, I can't do this. I can't, you know, he's too funny. So they ended up cutting it short, um, which is which is kind of sad. I wish I had the outtakes for that. No, I've got to be honest. After <laughs> watching it, I could see Jeff being a really, really naturally funny guy because he comes across just in spades throughout his performance. You get the feeling that when he is reeling off all those things during the, the interrogation scene, a lot of those are just probably popping into his head. Uh, some of it was based on his own his own uh, history. He he uh, has a sister named Edie, who he you know pushed down the stairs and blamed on the dog. Um, Edie actually grew <laughs> up to be Edie Fay, who is an incredible writer and uh, performer. But she did uh, the the uh, series Fuller House, the the update of Fuller oh, yeah. House. Hmm. They are two of the funniest kids. I'd ever met. And we would do uh, holidays over at Jeff's house and we would do Thanksgiving and sometimes Christmas if we couldn't go home or Easter, even though they were Jewish. Um, and it was just the place to be. And Annie Ramsey and her husband and the Lawrence kids, Joey Lawrence, uh, Maddie Lawrence and Andy Lawrence and, and their parents would always be there. And, and it was just, it was so much fun. There was so much laughter going on and Jeff was just naturally funny. Sure, and, and everyone kind of takes something away from this movie. In Richard Donner's case, he still has uh, one-eyed Willie's skull and the ship replica, as I believe. He did. He had the model of the, of the Inferno, and he had one-eyed Willie's uh, skull and patch. Now, Dick had one, or Stephen had one too, and I have a picture of uh, a purple flower in one of the eyes. Um, so it was kind of the crossover between color purple and goonies but uh dick, yeah dick had a, a lot of stuff and and he loved it i mean he just uh he really treasured that stuff well just bringing up the inferno um that whole set looked absolutely huge i mean i i i had seen those particular scenes before but actually seeing them in context properly uh made a lot more sense and i was blown away by just the sheer scale of that set now how on earth did that all come together it was in the days before CGI, so you know things had to be practical. And uh, the, we were shooting on Stage 16, which is the largest stage in North America. And Michael Reba was a genius production designer, and he filled up every bit of that. And the pirate ship was practical, so all the decks uh, were real. You know, the, the none of those were were breakaway sets or or insert sets, those that was all shot on the Inferno. And um, the sails uh, went right up to the, to the rafters. The, uh, they built little water slides that came out into the, into the water. It was huge. It was and the middle of the stage was actually, I think 20 feet deep. Uh, the rest of it was uh, four to five feet deep. It kind of sloped down. Uh, it was just an amazing set. And, and Dick had said, you know, told the kids they were forbidden, absolutely forbidden to see the set before uh, he wanted a genuine reaction when they, when they came up from the water and saw the pirate ship for the first time. Um, now I, I know for a fact that a couple of the kids did not wait. Um, they <laughs> snuck on, uh, I, I won't mention names, but, um, you know who you are. Uh, and, um, Josh said that he ruined a take because when they came up, and saw the pirate ship, I think Josh went, oh, shit. And so they had to go back down and do it again. Um, but it was their genuine reaction. Wow. Well, the thing is about the Goonies, and, and like I said, everyone loves this movie, and this has this real kind of rarity that the Goonies actually has its own day, yes. which is June 7th. Correct. Uh, and this started, what, in 2010? I, th I think it was 2010. That was when they also did the uh, 25th anniversary. It was a reunion type of thing. And in 2000, and it was all in Astoria where we shot the movie. So um, the at that point, I think Sean, Dick, Corey, and Jeff may have gone to that one. I went to the 35th anniversary reunion, which was really Jeff and Sloth Stunt Double and, and me. 
And, uh, but yeah, they, every June 7th, they celebrate it in Astoria. And I guess uh, the fans that can get there, get there and everyone celebrates wherever they are. I'm guessing that Josh Brolin didn't make it this time around for the 35th one because he was too busy trying to destroy half the universe. And actually there was no 35th one. They, because of COVID and, and uh, then I think Warner's kind of took His back. His plan worked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, there, there, there will be no more Goonies reunions in Astoria. That's for sure. But, you know, maybe down the road, there'll be something for the 40th or whatever. Well, actually on um, YouTube, there's um, there's a certain channel where a guy actually goes and visits film locations from like the 70s and 80s and what they look like now. And I watched the one for the Goonies where they went to Astoria, and it is incredible that it looks almost identically the same. <laughs> it does. Uh, the house fell into disrepair, the Walsh house, for a long time, and then a, a, a lovely woman named Sandy Preston, who was a Goonies fan as well, bought the house and fixed it up, kind of restored it, and allowed fans to come up and take pictures of the house and things. And it was a huge attraction, um, along with uh, I mean, people found Mouth's house, the bowling alley where Chunk gets the shake on him, um, uh, the Flabble house where Mikey's dad is the curator. And um, a lot of it is, is still the same. I believe the, uh, the prison is now actually a kind of museum. Is that right? Yes. Yes, it is. It's the Oregon Film Museum. So it actually is not only an homage to the Goonies, but also to Short Circuit, Kindergarten Cop, Free Willy 1 and 2. Um, I think The Ring was even shot up in Astoria as well. So they, they've had a quite a, a great uh, film history. Yeah, that's a, one place I'll have to go. That's upwards from California, right? That's one yep. of the upper Pacific areas. Northwest. Yes, it's yes. right on the uh, Columbia River and the uh, Pacific Ocean. It was actually uh, Lewis and Clark built a fort there called Fort Clatsop, and uh, it's still standing too. Well, we can't really talk about the Goonies without one person in particular who seems to be uh, part of the trend that Richard Donner had of working with actors on a regular basis, even if they were only coming back in small roles. Uh, and that is the the mother, Mrs. Walsh, played by Mary Ellen Trainer. She went on to play the psychiatrist in the Lethal Weapon movies. She had a small part in Scrooge. Was, was that kind of... Was that normal of uh, of Richard Donner to to try and keep those people close to him like that? Absolutely, absolutely. Dick, he had a repertoire company that he he loved using time and again. He also loved putting uh, his staff and friends in the movie. His agent Eddie Rosen, who got him the gig on The Omen, is in Lethal Weapon Two uh, by the side of the pool. Uh, Dick's wife, uh, Lauren Schuler Donner, was in Lethal Weapon Four as is Jenny Lou Tugan, who was Dick's assistant at one point and became his producer. Um, everyone, uh, we, I even made it into Radio Flyer in just one shot. Dick loved doing that. And so Paul Trippé, Steve Cahan, who was his cousin and was kind of spitting image of Donner in a way. I mean, the voice and everything. <laughs> yeah. um, yes, uh, I, I had a point on this. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, uh, Army Archard, who was the uh, a writer for Variety for for years, I think fifty years. His wife Selma is in uh, Lethal Weapon. She's the one, the cop leading the uh, the police carolers. Oh yeah, um, damn one. it, Dooley. Yeah, yeah. So yes, <laughs> exactly. So uh, yeah, no, that was definitely a conscious decision. And Dick, Dick just loved it. He he, um, uh, gosh, his niece, his mom, they were all in his movies. Well, following the Goonies, obviously, um, I believe that Richard was kind of up for the Lost Boys and instead took a producing role in order to take on Lethal Weapon. So you were still working for Spielberg around the time, but did you keep in touch with Richard? And when was the next time you came across him again? In 86, Goonies had been out for, I guess, about a year, and Dick was going to shoot Lethal Weapon, and um, he needed a projectionist at his home. And he knew I had done that for Stephen when I was working for Lucas. So Dick asked if I wanted to run films at his house. So I was working for Stephen during the day and running films for Donner at night. And then during production, I would run dailies and things like that. So Lethal Weapon was the first set of dailies that I ran. And then I also did Scrooged. 
Um, and uh, until, until I got into production myself and uh, couldn't do it anymore, but no, I had, had a wonderful time doing that. Dick was so inviting. He, uh, he would always invite me in to have uh, dinner with the guests. Usually they were standing around in the kitchen eating. Uh, there was a, 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 a Asian restaurant called Chin Chin, which has a very famous chicken salad. And Dick would always order that. I think he had ownership yes. in the company. And so he would always have the chicken salad brought up the hill. And um, everyone would stand around. And uh, one night uh, I was out in the in the booth waiting and Dick called me and said, "Hey, kid, can you come in for a second? And uh, so I went in. He said, "Would you would you mind filling up someone's car?" And I said, "No, not at all. I mean, I didn't mind that at all." And uh, it it was George Harrison, um, and George at the time was doing some of the music for Lethal Weapon yeah. too. Um, wrote a song for it, and so you know, you just never knew who was going to be up at Donner's house watching movies just like when at steven's house you know you never knew who was gonna show up yeah so I, it was it was a great fun running dailies and just one incident in particular the first couple of nights of lethal weapon dailies um i had just finished running the film and i was rewinding everything and the assistant editor billy meshover was waiting very kind of impatiently for me to give him the reel so he could take him back and lock him up and uh Dick comes into the booth and said, what do you think, kid? And I said, God, it looks great, Dick. And he said, uh, he said, you like Mel Gibson? And I said, yeah, he's a great actor. And he said, you want to meet him? And I said, well, Dick, I got to get the film. To... And he said, no, come on, come on. He, and he pulls me by the shirt. He pulls me out into the, the screening room. And Mel's talking to someone. And he makes me stand there and wait. And Mel finally finishes talking to whoever. And he turns to look at Dick. And Dick goes, Mel? This is your biggest fan. And he walks off. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Mel said, really? And what do you say? I mean, I, so I said, well, uh, you know, yeah, you're really, really good. And he, go, and he looked at me and goes, get it. and laughs and walks off. And it was, it was a setup. It was a practical joke. <laughs> so, yeah. A few nights later, Sean Aston was with me. Uh, I had picked Sean and his brother Mackenzie up. Mac was doing Facts of Life, and I had picked them up and and had to run dailies before um, taking them home. And uh, when it was over, Sean went up to to Mel and said, "He said, Mr. Gibson, I just want you to know you're my favorite actor. I know, I know. Get fucked. I know." And <laughs> and, and Mel just looked at him, <laughs> had no idea what was going on. So <laughs> so anyway, there were a lot of fun times. <laughs> well, I mean, Richard is one of those directors. I mean, obviously, going into Lethal Weapon, it was a very... Um, he spent a number of years doing a lot of family movies. And I guess you could even class even his, his production on The Lost Boys because it is very centered around family and things like that. And Lethal Weapon was such a radical departure, you know, to have a, a kind of ultra-violent cop movie, which I guess was kind of all of the rage in the 80s. You know, violence was really selling. Uh, and then to then transfer back to family friendly fare with Scrooge, which is now one of the most loved Christmas movies ever. Well, you know, it's interesting because if you if you look at Lethal Weapon, it is centered around family, you know, Murtaugh's family, but also Riggs becoming part of the family, that that whole story. So I guess you could argue it's a family movie, but yes, with a lot of language and violence. That's true. <laughs> yeah. But um, when we look at um, Richard Donner here, it's amazing from a little bit of research and you can kind of tick off which ones of these are true and which aren't, as you may know. Uh, he was considered apparently for a lot of huge movies over the course of the 80s and 90s. And the short list I've got here of interesting ones are Batman from 1989, Jurassic Park, The Lost Boys, which we know he was uh, up for, uh, Wild Wild West, mm. The Flintstones, Poor guy. Mm. <laughs> uh, Problem Child, Matilda, Judge Dredd, and Alien 3. How many of them are right? You, you know what? You've got me. I, I, all I can say is I don't think Jurassic Park was ever in the cards because Stephen uh, had a relationship with Michael Crichton. And when Michael Crichton pitched the idea, I think Stephen 
ran with that one. So I, I don't think, I don't know if Dick was really ever in the running for that. Um, the others wouldn't surprise me, although, you know, by the time Dick had done Superman and was, and was in demand, he chose his projects and he yeah. worked internally. So I don't think he, he never really accepted outside projects. Uh, now they may have wanted him for it, but, but I don't think Dick, Dick ever even considered it. Mm. That's just my take. No, 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 that's true. Because it could just be internet rumor. We don't know. And as we've proven before, the internet lies. Yes. yes. It does. That's what Abraham Lincoln said. Yep. <laughs> but one thing. <laughs> While riding on a Sasquatch. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I can't believe you caught me with that. Well, one thing that's definitely not a lie is the fact that the National Film Registry has two Richard Donner movies to its name in Superman the movie and The Goonies. And for a lot of people may not actually understand the whole process of a film getting selected and the kind of ceremony that surrounds that. And uh, do you have any idea? Not really other than uh, I think it has to do with the cultural significance. Um, yeah. You know, Goonies didn't do that well when it came out um, in June of 85. Back to the Future creamed it um, at the box office. And I think, you know, Warner's figured it was just going to kind of lay that way um, and never really make any more money until the generational change. You know, when when the kids who saw the movie when they were 9, 10, 11 grew up and became parents themselves. And it became a bonding ritual with their children to show the movie because it captured their imagination so much. And by that time, I think kids really didn't have the imagination that we grew up with. Um, you know, they had video games and things. So it was kind of a rediscovery of adventure. And that that resonates beyond the film world, I mean, into the real world. So I think that was kind of a easy thing. I mean, Superman, of course, because he was so iconic. And, and the movie is so innocent. Mm and and positive and good that i think that was just a natural too i'm uh, you know i'm waiting for the day when lady hawk also is joins the registry because i think it has a lot of the same qualities what are you laughing at steve sorry i I was just i was just thinking of um the the band lady hawk instead of the uh the film (laughs) oh there was a band yeah um paris is burning i think there was a big song it came out about about about, about 10 years ago wow i didn't know that apart from your kind of little online uh meetup there has been other news about the goonies that just got released this week and i wonder if you've heard about it that disney plus are actually doing a series kind of based around the goonies and from what i read about it earlier today it's a story about a school teacher who helped some kids reenact uh the scenes from the goonies movie which is their favorite movie growing up. And apparently Richard and Lauren are, were involved in this. Yes, as was Amblin, or as is Amblin. I mean, Lauren and uh, Justin Falvey and, uh, uh, and Daryl Frank uh, are still, anyway, they're still involved. And, uh, and it's moving forward. At, at, it was at Fox, uh, was put in a turnaround and, and uh, was picked up. So the, what, I guess what they're trying to quell right now is the fact this is not a remake of Goonies. It's not a sequel to Goonies. Yeah. It's simply kind of, no I much. guess, a fan inspired. Yes, I just like the the those those kids years ago who did the shot for shot remake of Raiders. Raiders, of Lost Ark. yeah, that is a and brilliant this, documentary on that. By the way, it is. There it. is, and this series is. I think this teacher helps bring these kids together by by doing this project with them. It definitely seems to be a popular thing to do now because the, recently there was one for, I think it was called My Robocop Remake and it came out around about the time that uh, they were rebooting yes. Robocop. Yeah, And then you could see stuff like um, Be Kind Rewind, the mm-hmm. Jack Black, um, Mos Def movie. And there was a movie in the UK called Son of Rambo, which is about two kids, mm. like little kids who sneak in to see First Blood at the cinema in the 80s and decide to reenact the movie during their play. And it's an amazing comedy. It is really heartfelt and sweet. So it's definitely a market for it. I think the thing is, I don't think they could have remade The Goonies, couldn't have done what Disney Plus has been kind of doing with like adventures and babysitting and stuff like that. It's too ingrained. It is the movie Mm. that parents are now showing their kids. Soon grandparents are going to show their grandkids. 
it's one of those movies that uh, just lasts forever. And I don't think people would accept it being a remake. No. No, I'll tell you one of the things about the fans, and, and I've, I've interacted with a lot of Goonies fans, and they are the loveliest bunch of people you could ever meet. They have a genuine love for Goonies. And I think the majority of them would say, do not remake it um, and, and don't do a, a, a reboot or anything else, you know, because it was perfect the way it was. And, uh, you know, over the years, there were several sequel scripts. Um, I've, I've read a couple of them and they just didn't quite capture it. Um, and if Donner was going to be involved, there, it, there was no way it was going to work. So um, Stephen was really tasked with approving the story. And I, th- I think that he never really found one that he really approved of. So th- what the fans would love to see, though, is a prequel, uh, how One-Eyed Willie became One-Eyed Willie, um, or Chester Copperpot. So mm. maybe down the road on Disney Plus, there's there's that in the cards. You never know. Which is kind of interesting, really, because is um, the Goonies owned by Warner Brothers? Yeah, Warner's distributed it. I mean, it, it's really an Amblin Entertainment film. Yeah, Warner's did put up the budget, so I guess they're you know. They do have uh, <laughs> part ownership in it, um, but they, I think they would acquiesce to Amblin uh, in any scenario. <laughs> HBO Max is there like, damn you, Disney Plus. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that could be, that could be a, an HBO Max 2 thing. I mean, that's, yeah. that's uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Goonies, the Richard Donner cut. Yeah. <laughs> now five hours long and in four by three. Yes. Now with octopuses and gorillas. That's actually a good question. Was it ever ex- <laughs> the octopus scene? Was that obviously hit the cutting room floor? But was there any explanation as to why that line about the octopus still remained at the end of the movie? I I don't think they even thought about it. <laughs> I think that it was just you know arbitrary. But but you know the, the the octopus scene is has been reinstated in the television version. So there is a version with. Um, the the scene where Troy tries to smoke the the map, um, and where the octopus is in there. So uh, I think they just didn't really care that much. <laughs> I think that octopus went on to have a better career when he started in Deep Rising. <laughs> yeah. But oh, there's my Deep Rising mention for the episode. Oh. Yeah, I, I guess I guess Bruce the shark wasn't available. No. <laughs> the strangest thing is Deep Rising is actually on Disney Plus, and that freaked me out a little bit. A poor woman getting sucked down a toilet. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Happens um, every day. Moving on. Some nice little uh, trivia bits here uh, regarding Richard and Donna. Uh, the movie Dragonheart, which I remember as being released on the 18th of October, 1996, which was my 18th birthday. Cheap plug there. Um, <laughs> Richard Donna apparently spent six months on pre-production on this and then... Uh, uh, whether he abandoned the project, left it, or just went on to other things. Do you know what kind of happened here? No, I don't know anything about that. Um, unless Dick had something else uh, in active development at the time um, that was similar. But, um, you know, Dick had a lot of a lot of projects in development, and it was just trying to choose. I mean, he had several things that didn't work out. One was a William Goldman script that uh, called Sea Kings, which was tremendous and he wanted tom hanks and uh sean connery to star uh sean connery would play blackbeard and i mean it's a it's kind of a almost a uh cross between princess bride and and uh, butch cassidy and it was the script was on the best i'd ever read and dick had committed to it and just as things were heating up cutthroat island came out ah. and, and by monday the project was dead in the water. In the water. Torpedo. With the octopus. Yeah. And that also <laughs> down uh, the infamous uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger movie called, I think it was called Crusade. I think the Corolco were doing at the time. And that was going to be a, a major movie for them. And Corolco also had Spider Man and a bunch of other stuff. It's amazing how one movie could just like shut down an entire company. You know, it's interesting because the only Schwarzenegger project that I, I knew that Dick was interested in was based on a one sentence premise. And it was, I, I can't remember if it was Joel Silver or another producer that came in and pitched Dick and said, okay, 
Schwarzenegger and Stallone in drag. And Dick went, my God, kid, that's brilliant. <laughs> and, and, you know, they started adding it up and they realized, okay, 20 million for Schwarzenegger, 20 million for Stallone. Dick would have gotten 10. The writer would have gotten four or five with, you know, with all the writers and then the rest of the cast and stuff. So they, they, they were at, you know, 60 or 70 million uh, just above the line. Just before. in conversation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So it never went anywhere. So more's the pity because we would have been greatly enriched by seeing um, Arnold and, and, you know, Sylvester Stallone in drag. You know full well as they would not have gone for any cheap shit either. No, I want the Louis Vuitton. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to have Gucci. Gucci. <laughs> Would it be great? <laughs> and the thing is, they've both done drag in movies before. Stallone infamously did it in the movie Nighthawks, which is one of the most hilarious things I have ever seen. Because I remember saying, "I guarantee you, when that person turns around, when that woman turns around, it's Stallone in drag." I thought it'd be great to have uh, Schwarzenegger doing um, ways. You know, the voice of the giving the directions in ways. Turn left now. You missed your turn. You are useless. <laughs> and you're flabby. <laughs> no, you're not going to the donut shop by every route to do to the gym. <laughs> oh, there's a whole hour right there. <laughs> uh, one other rumor uh, that is out there on the internet, that apparently uh, Richard was approached to direct Thelma and Louise. And rumor says that Richard wanted Lauren as a producer on it, uh, which apparently was a deal breaker with, I believe, MGM. Do you know anything of this? Is it true? Is it false? I knew that there was one movie uh, where Dick wanted Lauren as producer, but um, I didn't know it was Thelma and Louise. That's that's interesting. I, I don't know. Where are you finding these rumors? It's deep diving into the internet. That's all I can say. I always look at it. If it's written in more than one place, then... There's potential it's either copy and pasted or it might have some fact to it. You know, that's it's amazing because I I was there and I never really heard any conversations about Thelma and Louise or some of these other movies. Uh, like I said, Dick was so bent on doing his own projects that, uh, you know, there's every chance that he could have flirted with those things, but I really don't think that he would have ever seriously entertained it. Well, kind of brought up a little bit earlier on is the fact that Richard Donner and Steve Kahan look incredibly alike to the point where I actually thought that Steve Kahan was actually Richard Donner starring in his own movies, mm-hmm. especially as <laughs> Captain Murphy yeah. in uh, Lethal Weapon, also starring Tommy Hinckley as uh, the cop who walks in and takes a bet. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy Hinckley is the center of Hollywood, I'm telling you. Everyone is linked to Tommy Hinckley in some way. Yeah. Kevin Bacon, beware. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, yes, I mean, Steve Cahan was, um, you know, he was the other member of Lethal Weapon who saw out the entire series. Mm. Uh, well, there was Paul Trapay was one of them, but he went from playing villain to cop, didn't he? Yeah, Paul Trapay was, was in Goonies. Uh, I think he was in Scrooged. Uh, and the, Paul in, in Goonies plays the sheriff who takes the call from Chunk. Oh, yes. yes. And then he's, then he's the bad guy. In Lethal Weapon Three, and I think he was also the bad guy in Lethal Weapon Two, which who gets wow. killed, but then he comes back for Lethal Weapon Three. <laughs> well, I've got a I've got a great story for Lethal Weapon Three. Um, we were shooting at the Great Western Forum. We were shooting the hockey sequence from um, for Lethal Weapon Three, and during uh, one of the lunch breaks, uh, Rob Friedman, who was the head of worldwide advertising and publicity for Warner Brothers, brought the trailer for Lethal Three. And they put it up on the big uh, quad screen uh, in the center, you know, over the over the ice. And we all watched this, all the extras and everybody. And when it was all over, Dick turns to Pesci and said, Pesci, you are so funny. Well, Dick, who had not seen Goodfellas, didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and Joey said, how am I funny? What, I amuse you? And it got so worked up that it actually scared Dick. And Dick said, gee, I'm sorry, kid. And then everybody laughed and, and told Dick. Dick. 
Dick was such a he. Sometimes he was the, on the recipient of, of some of these practical jokes, and Dick loved it. He was always so gracious. We were there was a uh, party. It was baby shower, surprise baby shower for Steven Spielberg and Amy Irving, and it was being held at one of the um, the writers' houses who was working on the Talisman at the time for Steven. Um, and Dick showed up and with Lauren, and and uh, there was a buffet line. And Dick was already a little buzzed. And so he was standing in line and Jake Steinfeld, who was um, uh, Steven's trainer, was right behind Donner. And I don't know what made Jake do this, but he tied a helium balloon to Dick's belt loop. And it, it was, became a three students routine. Dick would take a step forward, the balloon would hit him in the back of the head, and he would turn around. And of course, nothing was there. <laughs> and he would take another step forward and hit him in the back of the head. And and people started laughing. And Dick went clear to his seat with this balloon trailing behind him and sat down. And everybody is howling, including Jake and Stephen. And Dick doesn't know what's funny, but he starts laughing too. And it, it, it gets to the point where nobody is even talking. They're laughing. And finally, Stephen tapped Dick on the shoulder and pointed up and Dick saw the balloon and realized what was going on. But he, he loved being the, the butt of the joke. I mean, he, he uh, was so gracious. Well, there's one thing that I would like to touch on. Um, Cause you said that he was usually the butt of the joke, but uh, one thing which seemed to follow him particularly throughout the movies in the eighties was something quite serious, which seemed to be the ending of apartheid in South Africa. Because that's something which popped up in Lethal Weapon 2. Uh, there's posters for it in the back of Scrooge. Was he actually a, uh, a bit of an activist? Or was oh, that just... more than a bit. Dick was, oh, Dick was a, a true, a, a tried and true activist. And he was from his earliest days. But um, once he had a, a forum, you know, with film, he, he used that. I mean, he, uh, Free Willy was... A, a, you know, a, a testament to anti-whaling and, and, and non-captivity Animal rights. for yeah. orcas. Absolutely. Hmm. Um, in Assassins, I think, uh, either Assassins or Conspiracy Theory, one or the other, Dick had no fur. Yeah, you name it, Dick was, and uh, Apartheid was one of them. Um, Dick actually told me one time, he said, because uh, in Oklahoma City, the uh, zoo there had an aquarium and had dolphins. And Dick said, you know, if they don't get rid of those dolphins, I will never shoot in Oklahoma ever. And uh, a couple of years later, they did get rid of the, the dolphins and Dick never shot in Oklahoma, but, um, but no, he was, he was very heartfelt about it and, and put it in wherever he could. Yeah. Also in assassins, there's a, an NRA national rifle association thing on the side of a bus. And uh, I understand he was very pro choice as well. Yes. So, yes. So he was he was involved in a hell of a lot of activism. Yeah, Dick was very was a, an avowed liberal and very proud of it. And his activism it wasn't just words. He he gave everything to it. And uh, you know I loved him for that because he he did something. You know he didn't just believe in something. He he acted on it. And uh, you know you find too many people paying lip service to some of the problems today, like homelessness, but but uh, nothing ever changes. Um, Dick was just the opposite and also very quiet about it. Dick never, never talked about some of the causes he supported or some of the people he supported. And I know some that I will never be able to tell you about, but, but uh, he, he was love and action. No, definitely. Uh, were you around obviously when uh, Richard Donner got his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, oh, along with Lauren, I believe at the same time? No, I can't remember when that was. I, I ended up seeing it on YouTube, but I wasn't there. And I I think I was out of town, but no one deserved it more. And unfortunately, I couldn't go to the tribute to Dick at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. I saw that as well. And, you know, I'll tell you, there there was no one that was loved more than Dick Donner. True. You know, the, I, I, I never, ever, ever heard one negative word against him. He loved life. He loved people. He he treated people with respect. He had fun with them. Um, he treated them like family. And people, you know, would give anything to work for him um, and uh, gave up jobs sometimes. They knew Dick had something coming up, but it may have been a few months down the road. They would turn down any work that uh, 
they may have been able to, you know, do in order to wait for Donner. So, um, yeah, much, much beloved. Mm. Well, one person who obviously loved him uh, a hell of a lot was Gene Hackman, who had worked with him on Superman. Uh, apparently, in the movie Postcards from the Edge, Gene Hackman based his performance on Richard Donner. Yes, yes. Gene did love, um, or I should say Mr. Hackman, uh, did love Donner very much and and said so publicly. Um, he told a story, I don't know if you've heard this or, or have told it before, but uh, when... Gene Hackman was hired for Superman. He met with Dick and uh, he had a mustache at the time. And Dick said, and Dick said, you know, you're gonna have to shave that off. And he said, no, no, I, re- I won't do that. Um, I'll play it with the mustache. And so Dick was trying to figure a way to get him to shave it off. And, and he was being really stubborn. And so uh, Dick met him on the first day of the shoot in the makeup trailer. And Dick had a, a, a mustache and uh he said look if you'll shave yours off i'll shave mine off and gene hackman accepted the challenge and he shaved his mustache off and he said okay now it's your turn donner and dick peeled the mustache off of his face (laughs) (laughs) it was fake and that's i think that was what won uh dick you know gene's respect (laughs) I've got to be honest, I can kind of uh, see Mr. Hackman's point on that one because a man and his facial hair is a, it's a very special bond. <laughs> yeah, unless it's in your eyebrows or you know, like a unibrow or yeah. something. Then. Well, uh, also in the realm of television, uh, Richard was very much involved in Tales from the Crypt, as was yourself, uh, as was Richard Mirish. It's strange. We're bringing all of our guests <laughs> into the <laughs> same realm. Um so, so how did uh, Tales of the Crypt come about? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, HBO, I think, had the rights. Uh, I believe this is the story. I believe HBO had the rights and reached out to Joel Silver, um, or maybe Joel had the rights. I can't remember which it was, but but Joel enlisted uh, Dick, uh, Bob Zemeckis, Walter Hill, and David Geiler as executive producers. And HBO made a whole series order uh, just based on that, I think they uh, the original or, original order was six, uh, and then they uh, ordered full seasons after that. But um, I was actually I had left Amblin because I really wanted to get into production, and I knew that you know I'd be in my seventies and I'd still be doing stuff for Stephen, which was fine. I mean, I love Stephen, but I really, really wanted to get into production, and Dick gave me that opportunity. And because he was involved in Lethal Weapon two, he made me his production representative on the series. So I was there for a couple of months and then, and then Dick had just wrapped lethal two and was, uh, had an eight day period before he had to do the, uh, the pull down of the house out in Valencia. And so Dick agreed to do, uh, the episode, dig this, dig that cat. He's real gone with Joe Panigliano. And, uh, the morning of the shoot, Dick had been up all night the previous night wrapping out lethal two came in and, uh, said, uh, uh, Hey kid, do me a favor. And, and, uh, Dick was terrible with names, really bad with names. He said, make a list of all the, uh, crew and their positions and their names, their first names, would you? So I said, sure. So I went a few minutes later, brought it back. And by, by everybody's, uh, position, I just put kid. <laughs> and, and, and Dick, said, Dick said, "No, no, no, kid. Their first name. Their first name." So anyway, I went back and you know <laughs> their names, and uh, you know Dick. Up until he died, he did not remember ever shooting that episode. He was so exhausted from directing Lethal Two, and then you know right after that, had to go do the house pull down at night. So we've kind of laughed about that over the years, but you know, so many things happened on that that that. Um, have stayed with me. And one was when I was researching for the episode, uh, Tower Records out in in Northridge had a CD of Calliope music. So I was on my way out to get get that CD just to kind of for, for mood. And on the way out, my Mitsubishi, the engine caught fire on the 405 freeway. And uh, the brake fluid uh, cylinder finally broke and 
and actually put the fire out, but the damage was done. There was about two thousand dollars worth of damage, and I had just started working for Donner, so I didn't have much in the bank, and uh, got the car towed, got a ride back to the studio. Uh, where Dick was shooting Lethal 2, and his trailer home was right outside the soundstage. I, I got there, and Jenny Lou Tugan said, um, what's the damage? And I told her, and she said, oh, that's too bad, and uh, left. 20 minutes later, came back in and said, Dick's taking care of it. Oh. And I was blown away. I mean, I I, I was speechless, but when, when Dick came in, I tried to thank him. And the more I tried to thank him, the more he was going, no, 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 no big deal. So Dick didn't you know, want that kind of praise. But what he did do, he had his assistant call Mitsubishi, the public relations rep there, I guess, and got the name of a person who was in a decision-making capacity and uh, asked them to take care of it because it was, it was a malfunction in the car and they refused. So he called back a little bit later and said, look, uh, my name is Richard Donner. I'm a film director. And he said, in my next movie, I'm going to have a a nun die in a Mitsubishi car fire. Or I'm going to have a Mitsubishi Mitsubishi run into a group of orphans and kill them. (laughs) And they said, oh, we can work with you on this. And so eventually Dick got reimbursed. Um, (laughs) But, uh, you know, now you you know why he was so special. And then the first day of shooting, um, Dig That Cat, the script supervisor came to Dick and said, Dick, we're, four minutes over. So we've got to, we've got to lose some stuff. And Dick threw the script to me and said, here, kids start cutting. Now this is the kind of person Dick was that, you know, you sink or swim with him. And if he trusts you, he's going to give you a task and you have to prove you can do it. So he gave me the script. I went into a room and I started figuring out what we could lose and still keep the story intact. Now, I, you know, I was scared to death because I didn't know really much about story at that point, things like that. Um, but I came up with four minutes that we could lose. And I went back to Dick and Dick said, okay, kid, go defend it. So I had to go talk to Bill Titler, the producer and Shane Black's brother, Terry, who wrote the episode and explain why we could lose those scenes. And it was agony for Terry Black, you know, cutting into his baby and, and uh, Bill Titler was siding with Terry and my only response was, well, you can go defend it to Dick if you want. No, no, that's okay. That's okay. So we shot the, the, the script, you know, truncated. And, and my only just, you know, I guess pride is that, that um, when the Cable Ace Awards came up the next year, Terry Black won for that episode. So I didn't ruin his script, um, which uh, he felt I did. So that was one thing, but, but it was a, it was a great shoot. I've got a, some outtakes from one of the scenes where they just Joey and Robert Wall couldn't get it right. And, and Dick was yelling in the background and stuff. I mean, half of Dick's uh, fright factor is his booming voice, but Dick also has the biggest heart of anybody. So you never, you know, you know, nothing's ever going to happen. Well, of course, uh, sorting you out with your uh, Mitsubishi is one thing, but, I'm surprised uh, he didn't wrangle you one of those Range Rovers from Lethal Weapon 3, Mark. Oh, that's okay. I uh, There were many in line before me. <laughs> <laughs> and in case well, no one knows what this story about is about, go on, Mark. I know you know this one. Oh, the uh, uh, Lethal Weapon 3, I think, uh, the um, made a deal with Warner Brothers that uh, if the film grossed a certain amount that, that uh, uh, wasn't all the all the principals would get Range Rovers, I think. And they had to run around town trying to find Range Rovers for, for the uh, cast. But, and that's just the way, that's just the way Donner was too. He was just that generous. I've heard an alternate version of this story. And let's, let's see if this rings true. Apparently Warner Brothers were um, giving them these uh, Range Rovers as some kind of rap party and a production party or something along that line. And it was only supposed to be for, I think, was it Danny, Mel, and Richard? But then apparently Richard invited other cast members. I think it might have been Renee and Joe Pesci and things like that. So Warner Brothers had to scramble to buy up <laughs> as many Range Rovers as they could for the other people that were invited. Is that true or not? Possibly. Possibly. <laughs> I mean, nothing would nothing would surprise me about Donner. <laughs> really wouldn't. I do remember seeing you know Dick's Range Rover. I remember that. 
Were you victim to the marching band at any point on the Lethal Weapon set? The marching band, no. Um, I've heard of this one. Refresh my memory. Okay, well, on uh, the Pure Lethal documentary that went out on one of the DVDs, every time someone's birthday happened on a Lethal Weapon set, this either mariachi band or a marching band would show up to play Happy Birthday to You. And apparently this was a regular thing that happened. And on the Pure Lethal documentary, it shows it's Renee Russo's birthday that she tried to keep quiet because she knew this band would show up. And apparently someone had spoiled it. And they actually get the footage in the documentary of her walking out of a door and this band starting to play. I had not heard that. That's interesting. You're going to have to watch that Pure Lethal documentary on the Lethal Weapon 4 DVD. Oh, yeah, I don't have that. I don't have a DVD player, but I will find it at some point. Probably on YouTube. Did you ever see Mel Gibson's video diary? No. From Lethal Weapon 2? HBO gave him a a, a camera. I think it was a Canon, I believe. And uh, uh, Mel did a behind-the-scenes comedy half hour on uh, on the set of Lethal Weapon 2. And it's it's hysterical. Mel just had a great gift of comedy. Okay, so kind of... um... In delving into the kind of wrap-up on uh, Richard, uh, what was what was Richard's filmmaking philosophies? I think a lot of filmmakers would resonate with them nowadays. Well, again, his his watchword was uh, verisimilitude, and he expected his cast and his crew to believe wholeheartedly in the story and what they were doing. And I think that comes across in every film he does, whether it's Inside Moves or or Lethal Weapon even. I mean, it's... Um, uh, and and Dick really cared about people. I think he had more confidence in people than he did in his own ability as a director. He, he always called himself a traffic cop. And obviously he was much more than that. But but uh, I think Dick put people first in everything he did. Yeah. And, and did he have more of a preference for Warner Brothers? Because the majority of his movies actually did come from that studio. Well, he had a deal with Warner's, I mean, from um, Superman on. So Dick set up shop in, uh, in fact, it's interesting because there was a building called one, Building 102 on the lot, uh, and it was Frank Sinatra Enterprises. So this whole building belonged to Frank Sinatra. And then when he moved out, I guess it was occupied a couple of different production companies. And then Stephen moved in um, during, I think it was... E.T. and 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 then of course Twilight Zone was Warner Brothers, so uh, Stephen had his base Amblin Entertainment there, and when Universal built Amblin for for Stephen, he mentioned that uh, you know he was going to be leaving, and Joel Silver said got dibs on it. He said you know because he had the building at the other end of this long corridor, so he was going to have all of that, and. When uh, Stephen told Dick that he was leaving, he told him the exact time he was leaving, and Dick went in one night and moved all his stuff in. And uh, when Joel Silver <laughs> protested, you know, Dick said that's tough. And and uh, so Dick had uh, Building 102, and so that was just his home. He he just you know once he felt comfortable in place and and working with Terry Semel and Bob Daly, who were the co-chairman of Warner Brothers, and Steve Ross, who was who, who owned um, the studio. It was a, a great period of movie making and, and camaraderie, and and Terry and and Bob and Steve Ross all, you know, treated their filmmakers with the utmost respect and and were very generous, and and that you know, and Dick stayed there until, I guess, uh, the new regimes came in and his deal was up and he moved off the lot. Which was probably after I think it was sixteen blocks. Was that the last movie that he did with Warner Brothers? I believe so. Or was it the last movie he directed? Oh, it was the last movie he directed. I can't timeline. I think was Fox, um, and uh, so I think no between Lethal Four and and uh, and Sixteen Blocks. Oh wow! Obviously, we've covered a hell of a lot of stuff on Richard today, and and you're one of the best people to kind of tell these stories from a personal vantage point. But other than what you've discussed today. What are the lasting memories of Richard Donner that are always going to stay with you? Dick's laugh, um, his generosity, um, and his his love for people. Um, you know, it's it. I think that's what hit me so hard was it just left such a big hole. Um, 
people die in Hollywood all the time. People die in, in life all the time. But, uh, you know, I mean, an artist always kind of hits a little bit harder because of the creative contributions they make and how they enrich your life. Uh, but, but Dick, well, it was his humanity. Um, he was larger than life. And when he was silenced, um, there was this just, it was like a black hole um, that will never be filled again. I understand uh, there was a very special moment for you on your last meeting with Dick. Yeah, we had a we had a reunion lunch in 2018 uh, of the Donner Schuler Donner Group, and uh, most of us were all there. And and um, you know, Dick was already, I think, 88, um, and had been in periods of ill health, and you know, he would rally and and stuff. But but um, and he was kind of working on Lethal Weapon Five at the time, and. And we were all hoping that it would happen for Dick because we wanted him to have a swan song. Um, but if nothing else, you know, the thing that came out of it was that um, I was able to tell him I loved him. And uh, he said he loved me. So I, he was kind of like a father figure, you know, and kind of a, a, a guide, a guiding light. So um, it brought some... You know, I mean, I'm glad I got to say it before before he passed away. Sometimes that's the that's the most important thing. Yeah, and he is the the father figure to a lot of filmmakers as well. Yeah, the outpouring of support on social media in reports, I'd never seen anything like it. You know, in a year that you know we we also lost people like Sean Connery and people like that, but Richard Donner's contributions and tributes kind of just dwarfed everything for an entire week. And it's amazing how every single person had a Richard Donner story. And that is truly a legacy that you can leave behind. And I can guarantee you that every one of those tributes was genuine. Yeah. You know, because they were all touched by Donner. That um, I, I was so lucky. And um, we can also guarantee that he probably would have read them all and gone, no, no, don't worry about it. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. We're going to, um, supposedly there's going to be a memorial service on his birthday next year. Uh, we're all going to meet in LA and, and, um, and do that. And, and, um, you know, I think he would certainly try to dissuade anybody from, from going. But, uh, but as Ki Hui Kwan said the other night, he said that, he said that, that we need to honor him. We owe him and we do. Yeah. And it's time for Lethal Weapon to go into the National Registry. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And Lady Hawk. What better way than it could be to go in this year? And it really should. Well, Mark, um, I just want to say thank you so much. I mean, it's, it's a real special time of the year. It's also the last episode of our second season as well. I'm so glad that we did get to round out this year talking about this incredibly special individual. Um not only as an artist, but also as a friend and boss for yourself as well, an inspiration for people like me who grew up on mm -hmm. all of his work. Um, and the, for everyone who's tuning in, you know, every single person has grown up with a love of Richard Donner's contributions to this business. Yes. Well, thank you for letting me be a part of it. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you, that's um, we can never honor Dick enough for, for not only for his talent, but for his humanity. And, and thank you guys for, for giving, you know, a, a whole show to him. He, he deserved it. Well, the best way to honor him is surely to nominate five. Now's the time to nominate five. Nominate five. Yes, nominate five. Not three or four or six or nine. Now's the time to nominate five. I was almost uh, contemplating not pressing that button then because I thought, no, this needed to be like a proper, more solemn occasion. But then after hearing the way that, that Mark was talking about him, I then thought that he'd probably be the first to go, no, 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 press the damn button. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> way to go, kid. Yeah. So, Steve, how are you holding up with your COVID? Are you still with us? I'm still with you. You perked up a little bit, which is good. I'm, uh, I'm guessing all of that 80s cocaine worked. I put what? <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> exactly. So what is Nominate 5, Steve? 
Well, nominate five is the part of the show where we invite our guests to nominate five things that are very personal to them on a given subject. And this week we've asked uh, Mark to give us his favorite five Richard Donner projects. Well, this is by no means going to be objective. So let's just get that out of the way first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Number one, Goonies. That, that, number five. Goonies. Number three, Goonies. <laughs> yes. No, it's number, we already number know two. what number one's going to be. So we might as well, let's start at number five. What are you, you, you may be mark? surprised. You may be surprised. So number five would have to be Lady Hawk because I know it was a project that was that, a film that was very dear to Dick's heart. Uh, it's also where he met Lauren. Um, so there, there was that, um, but it also, it's just, it's a timeless tale and it's a heartbreaking tale. If you, if you've seen it, um, you know, you know, that, uh, uh the, the, the story, uh, that these two lovers are doomed to never really see each other, be with each other because of a curse that's been placed on them. And, uh, Dick did it with such sensitivity and, uh, a great cast um, uh, except for the music, <laughs> which, oh. <laughs> which I, yeah. I, I felt, I felt deserved like a Jerry Goldsmith score, but, but, um, and Dick had other ideas, but, but it's still, it's still one of my favorites. Okay. What do we have at number four? Number four is a Dick Donner produced project. Uh, and of course, again, I'm biased because I was, uh, a producer on it as well. And that's free Willie, mm-hmm. um, which actually, we have Keith Walker who played Mikey's father in Goonies to thank for the story of free Willie. He wrote that while he was up in Astoria waiting to shoot Goonies. So, wow. Um, I didn't even but, know that. Yeah. That's uh that was Keith's story. And he wrote the script uh, along with Corey Blackman uh, before he passed away. And uh, uh, you know, everybody knows the story of free Willie. I know again, what it means over there, but you know, the story of a boy and a whale and uh, both, uh, outcasts and incorrigible and they find each other and save each other's lives. So uh, it was a, it was such a joy to shoot and very meaningful because it, you know, so many children were inspired by that movie to become uh, marine biologists or animal behavior specialists. Uh, and we have the letters to prove it. Yeah. Yes. Unfortunately, it also means it's probably the reason why we've got dolphin tail too. <laughs> but no. still, Free Will is perfect. a great movie. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay, then. So what's going to be number three? Well, number three is one we discussed, uh, I think, before we started, which was Maverick. Mm. Um, anytime you can get Mel Gibson, Jodie Foster, and James Garner together, and then add Graham Greene and the cameo by Danny Glover and Corey Feldman, <laughs> um, and, and some of the great Western uh, television legends uh like uh um uh, robert fuller and and uh, deb taylor and other people then then you've got a winner um and with a script by william goldman uh it was and dick's direction obviously it just was a perfect comedy that actually has to be one of my favorite cameos of all time just when yeah. he kind of leans in and there's just that moment and the lethal music comes in just very, very softly <laughs> on a guitar. I love that. It's perfect. Yeah, they had such fun making it. Too. That's also one of your Get It Fresh choices. It was, yeah. From yeah. season one. Yeah. Okay, number two. Number two would be Goonies. Um, for all the reasons mentioned before and, and uh, you know, the but the added bonus is that it was the first movie I was ever really involved in where I felt like I belonged and actually received my first credit uh, on a film uh, three weeks before my 10th uh, high school reunion. So there was that, but, uh, but Goonies beyond just the film experience uh, we've remained a family, which I've never, I know a lot of crews don't experience, but you know, I still keep in touch with some of the kids. And again, just that call the other night takes that experience way beyond you know, a film that is beloved and, and it's become uh, a part of my life, big part of my life. Uh, undoubtedly. So I, I guess it can only be, well, one of two, I guess. I doubt it's going to be Superman 2. So what's You're going absolutely to be right. One? It's Superman 1. Hey. Yeah, Superman the movie. Um, that was, you know, even though I had decided 
but I wanted to get into the film business in 76 and saw the omen and I knew Richard Donner's name and uh, I didn't really, I, I didn't know his filmography or anything. And, and um, when Superman was announced, I remember being so excited about this movie uh, that I vowed to, to, to get in to see it before it came out. And Sid Gannis, who was the head of worldwide advertising publicity for Warner Brothers at the time, uh, had just accepted a position at Lucasfilm where I was working. And uh, I met Sid and told him how much I love Superman. And he gave me a press kit and then two tickets to the premiere. Oh, that's and, awesome. Yeah, so like, I got to go to the premiere. Uh, unfortunately, I had a 104 temperature, but I didn't care. Um, <laughs> I, I watched that movie and forgot I was sick. Uh, I was socially distanced, uh, but, but I'll tell you, I, it, it, that movie has never left me. And I think it's one of the most, it's just almost a perfect movie along with a perfect score, uh, by John Williams and, and Dick's direction. Nobody could have, have directed it like Dick. No, it's an iconic movie. It basically formed the image, not only of Superman, but also of the entire superhero genre for the better part of, I'd, I'd say the better part of the next decade until Tim Burton started to uh, change it when Batman came out. But it's one yeah. of those movies which is just, it just is forever timeless and it just works so well with that character. So it's a and, great choice. And it's so innocent and so mm. genuine yeah. uh, that you can't help but get caught up in it. No, there's no kind of duality. He is all about truth, justice, and the American way. Absolutely. And also, it was the movie that was number one at the box office the week I was born. Ah, did you see it the week you were born? No, no. no. You waited until the next weekend. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you've got to wait. It's like this with Spider-Man, <laughs> which I am going to see tomorrow. <laughs> so I was waiting. You know what? If I can avoid spoilers for two days, I'm going to be all right. It got released here on Wednesday. It gets released in the US tomorrow, I believe. I think you're right. And I'm going to see it tomorrow before all the Americans come on with all the spoilers. So I'm going at two o'clock in the afternoon. No, I didn't invite you, Steve. And you know why? Yeah, because I'm not allowed out of the house until Monday. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing to do with Ghostbusters at all. It's just no, the fact it that you're rampant and disease yeah. infested zombie. <laughs> <laughs> This but is yeah, actually uh, Steve speaking. This is the brain fungus that's taken over. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, just to reiterate, Mark, uh, it has been an absolutely uh, amazing uh, time having a chat about Richard. It's one that we've built up to all year. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's been just a fantastic delve hearing stories that have probably never been told, finding out things that we've never heard about the man uh, that are going to be really just a, a complete part of any fan who can actually just tune in, listen to these stories and know a bit more about how special this filmmaker really was. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for giving me the opportunity. And uh, you know, I, I knew I wasn't going to make it till the end without some kind of emotion. So I, I apologize for, for getting a little emotional there. It's okay. You lasted about 90 minutes. So <laughs> <laughs> that's the impact on her head on us. Yeah. yeah. At the end of the day, it's genuine. Right, you don't have to apologize for anything genuine. No. You know? So no. Uh, at the end of the day, it, it just reinforces exactly how special he was. And I guess the way to kind of wrap the show up, Steve, is to once again, for the last time this season, mm. ask what's in the box. What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? I'll tell you what wasn't in the box. The toilet paper that we ordered from a certain well-known British supermarket that arrived this <laughs> evening. That's what wasn't in the box. <laughs> oh, my God. We've already started on the loss of toilet paper again. God, this yeah. is this is really is this the third wave, second wave. I don't even know how many bloody waves we've had. I don't care. I don't go out anyway. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, I've got a, I've got a sit in a sold out theater tomorrow to watch Spider Man, and it's like I've never been to one that's actually been sold out before, and now I've got to sit next to a stranger with a Macintosh on his lap. <laughs> <laughs> appears to be peeling bananas very quickly. Um, <laughs> Is that web? Yeah. So, um, 
What's in the box? What is it, Steve? Yeah, what's in the box is the part of the show where Andy's going to improve my movie education by dragging me away from my Xbox. He's going to be putting his hand into a box and pulling out the name of a movie, which is certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Now, if I have seen it, we keep pulling out names of movies until we find one that I haven't seen, and then I go away and I watch it the night before we record our next show, which in this case is going to be in series <gasps> three. Yes. Ooh. So go on, what is it? Funnily enough, when we're talking about superheroes, and this superhero's name has come up today, mm-hmm. but you're delving into the DC animated universe, Steve. Okay. For Batman Gotham Knight. Gotham Knight. You know, I'm a... Have I seen that one? Why are you asking me? <laughs> I'm... My brain is riddled with COVID. Um... Gotham Knight. I, you know what? I cannot honestly remember if I have seen that or if I haven't. Right. Okay. I genuinely, cannot remember if I have seen that or not. Well, you know what? Let's treat it like you haven't. Okay then. All right. That's okay. a good. That's a good plan. Yeah. It's, it's Kevin Conroy. You're gonna love it. Oh yeah, so- I love Kevin Conroy. If you're listening, Kevin, hi. You are Batman. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, Steve will uh, obviously open. Uh, the first episode of season three, we have some unbelievable guests that are just starting to pour in. Word has got out about this podcast. I have no idea how, because no one bloody shares it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, some, pe- some people <laughs> share it. But um, no, word has got out. We've got some uh, We've got some award winners and some mm. award nominees coming on yes, to we season do. three. And no doubt Mark Marshall will be back with us. If I didn't ruin your chances for a season three with this show. <laughs> so okay. No, no. You've not upset the sponsors. Because oh, <laughs> you don't have any. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yes, uh, we'll be back for season three, and Steve will give his feedback on Batman Gotham Knights. So we start with a bit of superheroes, which is good. Yes. Um, everybody, uh, New Year is upon us. We're all going to be celebrating like crazy, and we just want to reiterate, uh, be really safe. Uh, look after each other, use common sense where COVID guidelines are around because we really can't afford to lose listeners. No, no. (laughs) So in other words, be like Dick Donner. Yes. Yeah. Be like Dick Donner. Don't do what Dick Donner doesn't. Yeah. That's a lot of D's. (laughs) I don't even know if it makes sense. I just think it sounded right. (laughs) It probably doesn't. But yes, um, for now, uh, I guess it's Happy New Year, everyone. Yes. And uh, we'll see you in the 22. Happy New Year, Andrew. Happy New Year, Steve. And to you too, Mark. Take care, everybody. Be safe. And see you then. Bye. Oh, shit. Wrong button. (laughs) You absolute dick. How could you play the wrong theme music to play us out? You know what? You're leaving that in. Can you cue up the right music, please, Steve? Cheers. Leave me alone. I'm not well. (laughs) Get back to bed, Steve.